Hello and welcome to Living Off Earth, NASA's reflection on Skylab, America's first space station, and 40 years of U.S. long-duration spaceflight. I'm Lauren Worley, and I'm your host for today's lively discussion. Years before Neil Armstrong placed one foot on the moon, plans were already in the works for a long-term habitat in space. Skylab rocketed to orbit in 1973, and the nine men who comprised the three crews that, that um, went to space pioneered life and microgravity, performing over 300 experiments during their 171 collective days in space. And all along the way, they broke records not only for long duration space flight, but also for advancements in scientific and technological achievements. We're joined today by two of those legendary astronauts, astronaut Owen Garriott, who was the science pilot on board Skylab 3, and Jerry Carr, who had commanded Skylab 4 mission. We're also joined by Kevin Ford, who's commander of Expedition 34 to the International Space Station. And we have with us two guys who are working here on the ground, but are helping us get to space every day. Marshall Porterfield, who's the director of Space Life and Physical Sciences here at NASA headquarters, and Jason Cruzan, director of Advanced Exploration Systems, also here at NASA. We're gonna to get to the questions of you guys here in the audience and those folks in our online community. But before we do that, we've got a quick video all about Skylab. So let's, let's go to the video. Skylab starts in the dreams of the people who wanted to go into space for a long time, early in the 20th century. We saw people who were thinking about how do we get humanity off the planet Earth and into space. There was a, a vision, a long-term vision the humans had of, of exploring and going beyond, higher, farther, faster. There was the technical challenge, there was the scientific interest, there was the adventure, um, and there was just simply the demonstration of managerial and organizational and industrial economic competence uh, in a world that was contested. So that was Skyline. Throughout the 1960s, they looked at a number of different ways in which you could take the Apollo uh, materials, particularly Saturn V and, and the Apollo spacecraft, and do space station-like things with them. So by the end of the 1960s, 1969, right after the successes on the landing of the moon, the attention turns to uh, the space station program, and Skylab is really born there, being the program for human spaceflight uh, during the early 1970s, and, and to build our basis for experience, uh, and to address those important questions that we had, which were, could humans physiologically adapt to long periods of space? Early 1973, we already launched Skylab. The Skylab Saturn V is sitting on one launch pad. The, the two launch pads we have for the Apollo program, uh, Skylab is sitting on one launch pad, and just a little ways away on the other launch pad is this Saturn One vehicle with the command and service module because Skylab launches one day, and the vehicle with the first crew uh, was supposed to launch the next day. Three. Unfortunately, when Skylab, the laboratory, goes up, the micrometeoroid shield that was on it that also provided heat protection for the vehicle uh, rolls back, jams into the solar arrays that there are two big five kilowatt each solar arrays that we're supposed to deploy. Skylab gets in orbit, it's crippled. Uh, and, and we're in big trouble because uh, Skylab needs that energy from those big solar arrays to operate and for the mission to be successful. And in 10 days, they quickly come up with a plan. We had people sew together a parasol sunshade that they could uh, erect outside the station. They came up with some equipment that the crews could use to try and unstick the giant solar array that was stuck. And Pete Conrad and his crew, the, the first Skylab crew, go launch 10 days later and save the entire program. The you know, two and a half billion dollar program would have gone down the drain if um, the crew hadn't gone up there and saved the mission. Bye bye, Skylab. The story of the launch of the Skylab Orbital Workshop is one of those great triumphs of things going bad and engineers and humans and astronauts working together to fix them. They have a very successful, almost month long mission and uh, proved that, in fact, first that Skylab will work, that humans are really important to those things, and they get a lot of good scientific data. And of course, we had two more crews that launched uh, later in the year. The second Skylab crew goes up for a longer period and um, you know, does lots of Earth science experiments, lots of solar observations. 
And then the third crew finally launches at the end of 1973 and early into 74. They're up for almost three months. And they observe, uh, do solar observations, do more Earth observations. We do experiments with students. That's the first NASA student experiments go on during Skylab. The last crew leaves Skylab uh, in early 1974. So a very successful program overall, despite the fact that it almost, on the first minute of, of operations, almost went uh, in the drink. One of the real triumphs of Skylab is that it basically took a situation gathering both the limits of what was possible and the possibilities uh, presented by incredible technological developments and put them together in a program that produced tremendous benefits in science, education, what spaceflight is all about. So it's a stepping stone. It was the stepping stone between the Apollo program and then later definitions of what spaceflight would mean for the United States. Skylab is the first step. We learn how to operate in space. We build on that with the ISS. We now go on further beyond low Earth orbit to visit an asteroid and then on to Mars. That's the plan, and that's where we're going. All right, thank you. That was that was great, and thank you to our historian, Dr. Bill Brary, who's here with us today, uh, uh, who for, for participating in that. So we're going to get into the discussion now. As we mentioned earlier, if you're following along with us at Twitter, you can send us your questions using the hashtag #AskNASA, and the discussion will be followed at hashtag #Skylab. We're also taking your questions at Google Plus and Facebook. But before we get started with our audience questions as well, I have a couple questions for the panelists. And I'd like first to start with, with Owen and Jerry, because we just watched this great video that told us a little bit about the official history of Skylab. I, ho I was hoping, starting with Owen, you could tell us a little bit about your impressions and what we should know about it. Well, there's so many things. As a matter of fact, if you're asking about basic material, there's a 500-page book that uh, David Hitt, myself, and Joe Kerwin uh, published about four or five years ago, and that will tell you far more detail than we will be able to accommodate here this afternoon. Uh, but I think it did take the first step into living in space, homesteading space, we call it here, and uh, I, I think that's essentially what the program provided. Uh, it verified the fact that people could live, work, do productive things for long durations, and then it also took the first steps into the uh, science that we also wanted to have on board. So uh, that's, in a nutshell, the kinds of things, long duration and, uh, and useful science that uh, were above the atmosphere so we could see in ultraviolet X-ray wavelengths, which we cannot see from the ground. Well, I think uh, uh, some of the other things that were accomplished operationally on Skylab was that we, uh, uh, we dealt with problems having to do with scheduling and productivity. And uh, uh, we, we came to some solutions that worked very well. It took a while to get there. Uh, but uh, those solutions that we came across uh, were, were used on subsequent missions to some degree. And some of the lessons had to be learned all over again. But uh, that's the nature of the space business, I think. Uh, and uh, the, the productivity is the most important thing. Uh, you've got to be able to get things done up there. And if you don't get things done, then you know, public money is being wasted. Well, and speaking of continuity, we've now had folks on the International Space Station for 13 years, and one of those individuals is Kevin Ford. And so, Kevin, I was wondering if you could share with me and all of our audience here a little bit about your training and maybe how it compared to the Skylab folks and how you got ready to go to space. Absolutely. Well, first, let me just say what an honor it is uh, to be here with these two gentlemen. Uh, Skylab really represents uh, something to us, which was the first long duration, you know, stays in space. And there's a lot of uncertainty when you go, you know, everybody has uh, has a little bit of angst, I suppose. How, how am I going to stay there for a long time? In my case, I was expected to stay about four and a half months, and you have some butterflies involved with, with doing that. But uh, when you get up there, you know that uh, people have been here before, and other crews even before me, of course, on Space Station had been there and, and had a lot of things that they could tell me. But really, the Space Station was built around what we learned from the Skylab. Uh, what they put up there for us, uh, the way the modules were sized and the way they were constructed in space and all that kind of stuff came, came out of what we learned from Skylab. Uh, the, training, uh, the training now involves just so much, and I'm sure they had the same types of things, a lot of 
you know, you have to think about the basics first, uh, just, just living in space and medical operations. We were our own doctors, for example, in space. All that stuff is important. It takes a lot of training, especially uh, for somebody like a pilot. You know, if you're going <laughs> to teach me how to pull a tooth, that you're going to need some time to do it. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of training involved for the basics, but then also, of course, we're up there for the science. And, and uh, we get to go to all the centers, not only in, in the U.S., but uh, overseas as well, to learn about the science and how to do that. And, and take care of uh, the assets we have on board, and of course take care of the space station. So a lot of uh, elements uh, to the training. It's about two and a half years uh, involved in it now for a, for a five to six months day. And speaking of that science, <laughs> that, was, that was perfect, Kevin. It was like we have a show going here. Uh, Marshall <laughs> uh, Porterfield can tell us a lot about that science, and, and I think you had a fairly similar job to a uh, job that Owen also had at, at NASA in terms of um, space exploration. Tell us a little bit about the experiments we're doing on station now and, and how that relates to some of the history, what we learned with Skylab. Well, in terms of the, the link to the history of Skylab, it really, um, the productivity that they had during that time period is noteworthy. They conducted over 2,500 separate individual investigations in the area of heliophysics, astrophysics, um, earth observation, uh, in engineering and technology development, life sciences, and also did student experiments on Skylab. And that's over three, three Skylab missions over 171 days, so incredible level of productivity that we are working towards matching right now in terms of ISS utilization. So we, we've had crew up there for almost 13 years. We have already a great um, portfolio of research um, that's being done. A lot of the things that were discovered during the Skylab era, like um, bone wasting. These were the first studies that documented uh, calcium loss in, in bone in astronauts over long duration periods of time in space. We're still doing research in those areas now on International Space Station. So there's a very strong link between well, the foundational studies that in some cases actually wrote the textbook on some um, space science phenomena and those that are con continuing on today on the International Space Station. Thank you. And so we're looking to go further into space. And Jason, who's here from our advanced exploration uh, work, you know, right now it takes, it takes 14 minutes to get a signal to Mars, right? So some of what we're learning, the communications work that went from Skylab to Earth, from ISS to Earth. Now we're working on these systems that will be able to get us even further. Can you tell us a little bit about the, how what this work that we've done has informed what we're going to do to get to an asteroid and onto Mars? Yeah, starting, I mean, even Skylab to a period of times, we had uh, real loss of signal. Uh, we didn't have continuous comm. You go to something like, like this weekend when we we're doing an EVA, and we have not only near continuous com communications, but we also have near continuous video of things as the operation is going on. We're actually going to, as we go further and further from Earth, um, we're going to actually revert back to actually the loss of signal kind of uh, style of communications, where those time delays will increase to a point that real time communications doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. That, that planning and the orchestrating of the mission challenges becomes even more important. Um, you don't have the, the ground support crew every day right, right on the comm loop with you, uh, or you'd be slightly delayed or offset, so you have to have more autonomous systems. You have to have the crew be able to replan events in a more uh, autonomous way or automatically by themselves. As the crew so sees something happen, they can replan their day uh, right away to try to minimize that uh, communication loss in order to keep the productivity up at the same time. So that communications delay is going to be one of the biggest challenges of how we change our operational paradigm. Um, and in some ways, we can actually look back at Skylab as a reference to how that was done um, and, and actually learn from that going forward versus actually what we do with Station today, which is very, very uh, continuous communications. So. Great. Great. We're going to get ready to take some questions from the audience, but I have one more for Jerry and Owen because, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring space, but we think we're alone in this universe. But when you got to Skylab, you found out we're not alone. And I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about what you found when you, when you arrived uh, for Skylab 4 mission and, and what the folks on uh, Owen's crew left for you. Well, when we finished docking uh, with the Skylab vehicle, with the uh, lab, uh, of course, with mission control wouldn't let us get out and go in. We had to spend the night in the command module. So by the next morning, we were clawing at the door ready to go to work. Uh, we went in there, and uh, Ed went in first, as I remember, and he said, hey, Jerry, come and look at this. And I said, what? He said, come and look. Well, we went down uh, to the, the uh, uh, living area, 
And sure enough, sitting on the pot was a dummy with, uh, with uh, I don't remember whose, I don't know whose uh, name was on it, but one of our names was on it. Another one was on a bicycle uh, and had his feet attached to the bicycle. And uh, uh, the third one was, uh, as I remember, in the uh, wardroom standing behind the, the uh, table to, uh, eating. So uh, we said, okay, those guys did it to us. We've got to find a way to get even. <laughs> I really enjoy that story. Let's well, let's take some questions from the audience. Thank you guys, and uh, um, we've got one right down right down here. Hi, Jeff Wallace, Rocketman. Rocketman five twenty eight on Twitter. Uh, I've, I've met your uh, your your son at another at uh, South by Southwest, a rather entertaining character. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you inspired him to want to go to space, uh, Owen? Well, uh, you're referring to the fact uh, that my son Richard has also had the opportunity to go to space. We're, in fact, the only father-son uh, pair in the U.S. who has had that opportunity. And so uh, I did not know I was doing it at the time. For, for one thing, it is so unusual to have this opportunity to, to, uh, to go to space in, in whatever capacity, as a pilot or as a scientist or whatever. I didn't uh, to push him in that direction at all. I knew he was interested in it, but I had no idea that he really had that as an as a, uh, objective in his life. And I was surprised some years later to find uh, that he had uh, indeed uh, worked with companies, and he was one of those people who would uh, be able to fly with the Russians uh, on uh, Soyuz uh, up to the ISS. And so it came as a surprise to me, actually, when I found out that he had acted upon his wishes, which I had not particularly encouraged. Not, I certainly didn't discourage it, but I didn't encourage it because it was such a remote possibility. And so it was really something that Richard pretty much did on his own. And I was very pleased to assist or contribute to it, uh, his uh, success on that program, uh, whenever I could. Great. I think uh, we've got a question coming to us from social media here. Trent, why don't you uh, go ahead? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. OK, so we have a similar question that came into both Google Plus and, and, and Twitter. Uh, and it's basically boils down to, it, it, and Dr. Porterfield started to touch on the legacy a little bit, but is there a big difference between the type of science that was conducted aboard the International Space Station compared to what they could conduct on Skylab? Good question. It, it, wants to be. Who's that for? Who's that question for? Maybe, maybe start with you. Well, they came from, yeah, they came from uh, Twitter, Twitter well, and Google+. Plus. Similar was there a big difference between the science we did and what yeah. you guys do? You, you want to address Okay, that? Well, I'm just going to say it's, it's, a, it's a growth <laughs> prospect. I mean, we did uh, uh, the uh, solar physics, for example, but you now can do the steps on beyond what we did on Skylab. And in some ways, you've uh, completed uh, uh, some of the work, but you go to the next step. And so I would say uh, the same general research areas are still there, but it's a more advanced techniques that are now available uh, with the uh, uh, longer durations and uh, the improved hardware that we now have available after some 40 years, after, as you would expect. Do you want to add to that? Well, I just might add that you know it was built from the ground up. Uh, the International Space Station, you know, to accommodate express type payloads and new ideas, with uh, all kinds of plumbing, you know, for for vacuums and gases and power and cooling, uh, just so that people could come in with ideas even downstream, and still get them aboard. And uh, today, regularly, we install new modules and new racks and new drawers and that sort of thing that are accommodated easily by the construction of the International Space Station modules just to take, take on new science and ideas. And so far we've done really well with uh, when, when people came in and said, man, here's, here's what I would like to do on the space station. Usually the provisions are there to get that done. So it's uh, very, very capable just, just to get the different types of science. There are also external platforms and, you know, uh, express uh, logistics carriers on the outside, like we put AMS on the outside, kind of, you know, later on it was able to accommodate the alpha mag magnetic spectrometer, for example, at, at a later date. So it was, uh, it was really built to accommodate all this, and uh, ag again, that was uh, a bit of the legacy that, uh, that they brought to us. I just want to make a couple of comments. It, it, the hardware that we have available now to do the science on the International Space Station is much more advanced, just because of the, um, the advancement of science in general. So, and we do have significant investment in hardware capabilities to do life and physical sciences research on the International Space Station. Uh, just one example is that some fairly rudimentary um, experiments were done on Skylab with rice seedlings. On International Space Station, using the European cultivation module, we grow 
plants from seed to seed, the complete life cycle. And we also can do, uh, center, we have a centrifuge for controls. So we actually have a 1G control in space uh, for those types of experiments right now. So we do have much more in terms of advanced capabilities, do a better job of doing good science on the International Space Station. Great. I'd like to point out okay. that uh, uh, one of the big differences between Skylab and the International Space Station is that uh, uh, our, uh, in our life sciences work, uh, the, the uh, metabolic analysis and, and those kinds of experiments that we did on Skylab uh, required us to be on a very, very strict diet. Uh, we worked with the nutritionists uh, before we left, set the diet, and then we could not vary from that diet, and that's a big difference from uh, the, the <laughs> comfort they have. <laughs> yeah, these, these lucky guys get all we sorts really of good things to eat up there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wanted to met, uh, tell, give you a little vignette here, and that is that I went to a meeting in Berlin of the Association of Space Explorers, and uh, one of the cosmonauts there, named uh, uh, Manarov, uh, told me how grateful the Russians were that we did those experiments because it helped them uh, very much in the planning of their own experiments. So here's another point where all of our data is free to the world. And uh, I think that's something for, for which we should be very proud. Great. We've got a question from the phone line from Robert Perlman at collectspace.com. Mm -hmm. Robert, please uh, ask your question. Oh. Hi, thanks. Um, for Owen, Jerry, and, and Kevin, from a crew member's perspective, realizing that you can only talk to your experience, which space station design lends itself better to a long-duration outpost? One very large room like was on Skylab or small self-contained modules like that on the International Space Station? <laughs> Yeah, he wanted to know whether we like the large uh, volume better than the smaller <laughs> volumes. But, you know, my preference would be for the larger volume, but I'm, I'm, I'm biased in that uh, uh, perspective, of course, uh, because you can do so much more with it. For example, the manned maneuvering unit, which we first tested out on Skylab, could be done with cold gas nitrogen thrusters on the inside of Skylab before we ever had to venture outside and face the hard vacuum that we would when we had verified that the hardware was all working correctly. And so that was one advantage that was only available because we had a large volume in which to test it. And so uh, I think that and a few other examples really demonstrate the value of having a large volume for the times that you really need it. And of course, with my bias already accounted for, uh, I, that would be my preference. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I would say, uh, in general, it's nice to be able to reach a wall and that sort of thing from maneuvering around and working across uh, volumes and stuff. But I, I'm very jealous when I see that film of the, uh, the acrobatics the we were seeing, the tumbling inside. So uh, somewhere up there on Space Station, we, we need a big ballroom, you know, can you that we could dance in if we could. We do dream of that. We have uh, a pretty open area. Uh, Kipo is a pretty big module, and that's where we do some of our... Um, experiments that require a large volume, like spheres you might know about, the, the small satellites that uh, can fly around and do maneuvers relative to each other. And so sometimes you do need a big volume on board. And uh, we, you know, we, we have a kind of a trade-off there because we had to get these components up in the, in the payload bay of a space shuttle. So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe in the future we'll find another way. <laughs> All right, I think we have a question up here uh, in this area. Go on ahead and I think, I think it's Zippy G on Twitter. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Glenn Gonzalez uh, from Baltimore, Maryland, Zippy G2 on Twitter. Um, <laughs> my question uh, is not mine, but it's from Jamers3294 in Michigan. Uh, it's for Owen and for Gerald. Um, what was the material used to cover the exposed area of Skylab? What was the material that we yeah. covered? Skylab. Multiple sheets of gold mylar, mylar wasn't it? Are you talking about the original covering or what we uh, had? <laughs> I'm thinking that it's the replacement. The parasol? <coughs> replacement yeah. And the sails? Yeah. 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 Parasol and sail. I don't know exactly. I, th I think it was nylon, but it was uh, had some of the material impregnated in that as well. And uh, there were two kinds. One was the parasol on the first crew, and then the second crew had a sail which laid down on top of that because the first uh, parasol was beginning to deteriorate. You have to remember that it was uh, uh, designed, built, tested, folded up, everything within 10 days. 
And so they had a little bit longer to think about what the really the best material would be for the second mission. And so it, maybe the, the surfacing or the material that was uh, uh, on the uh, nylon was a little different. But I can't go into any more detail because I don't know the answer in, in more detail than that. Do you have any? As far as I knew, it was it was sheets, multi sheets of gold gold uh, mylar, and uh, many many sheets in order to to get the uh, insulation effect that you're looking for. Good. Okay. Um, Trent, do we have any more questions coming in from uh, social media? Yeah, from Twitter. Uh, how much training do you have to do before you actually go up into space? And what does it feel like the first time? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go for that one. It, uh, it, when you first get to NASA, you've got to go through astronaut basic training. Uh, back in, uh, in our day, uh, you were considered to be an astronaut when you showed up at the front door. And when you finished training, then you were qualified to fly. Uh, uh, for the, the uh, later on, when you got into the shuttle era, uh, the the uh, people who came as they were astronaut candidates, and uh, uh, they required about the same amount of time, about a year or so of basic training, and then they were considered ready to to be assigned. Now, once you get a mission, you start a whole new training cycle, and that whole new training cycle can last anywhere from from one to two and a half years. Uh, my, my particular crew on Skylab, since we were the last to fly, we ended up with three years of, of training. But the first two years of our training was helping the other two crews get their training plans put together. And so we were kind of the guinea pigs. Uh, I, heard, uh, uh, I heard Kevin say that it uh, about, what, two and a half years mm -hmm. for you guys. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff to learn, not just the operation of the uh, of the vehicle, but all of the science that you have to learn how to operate. It really takes a long time. For those in the audience, if you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand so our able microphone handler can see you. Um, and if you're following on uh, online, you can follow the hashtag Skylab for the discussion. And if you have a question, go ahead and send it to Ask NASA, hashtag Ask NASA, or on Google Plus or Facebook. And speaking of science experiments, astronauts and education, uh, <laughs> Leela Melvin here, who's also a colleague of yours. And the, another first for Skylab was it was that the first time student experiments had gone to space. And that was an original idea in 73. We've continued to do that. And uh, Marshall, I was going to ask you, what have we learned from some of the student experiments that have that have gone now onto the International Space Station? I think the thing that was most important about what happened on Skylab was the, we, we realized the magnitude of the impact of the student opportunities and what, that, the, that you really did get deep penetration into the education systems because of the imagination that the students brought to these projects. Um, not all of them work. I think it's okay for the students to uh, learn and um, and take chances that we normally wouldn't um, do. I think some of the interesting things that were done with spiders were 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 innovative at the times. So, uh, they were able to show that spiders could adapt to microgravity. First, they couldn't make webs, but then they would adapt and they could actually make webs. So. Using uh, model organisms like that was really innovative. I'm just going to extend that question a little bit. How many of the, is the name Arabella ring a bell with any of you? <laughs> so there are several remember Arabella and her cohort Anita, who with two spiders we brought up in a little container the size of your thumb. And we had them in a box, as you were describing. And uh, when they were first released, the first night, uh, and night was whenever we were all asleep, um, they were very scruffy looking webs, but by the second or third day, they'd begin to spin a web that would do a good justice to your backyard or, or the garden at home. And so it was really amazing how with no foresight, no knowledge about what was coming, they very quickly adjusted and adapted to a weightless environment, and, and uh, uh, the, the way they spun their web was to be, walk around the edge and attach it again, walk around the edge and attach it again. And they do that around enough times, and pretty soon they have a web that just like they had at home, although they'd never spun a web like this before. So it's a remarkable job that the uh, spiders, they were uh, cross spiders, they were called, because of a little cross on the back of their uh, shell. And so it was really a, a fascinating experience. And uh, by the way, Marshall Space Flight Center, who put this program together, still follows most of those, uh, I think it was 40 total uh, experimenters, uh, that, and they occasionally have had a reunion uh, back in Huntsville uh, for those uh, students. And uh, the young lady, I think, went into life sciences of some sort after she uh, uh, graduated from college. She was a high school student at the time. 
Are they still doing it, uh, high school experiments today? Yeah, they, there's multiple different mechanisms for students to do um, space-based research right now. Part of that is we're leveraging our um, uh, relationship with NanoRack. So we have commercial hardware providers that are actually facilitating a lot of under, uh, student mm -hmm. research. And we also have our working with ISS program right now to develop a program called Postgraduate Innovation Awards to allow uh, uh, students to do their thesis research and uh, research at that level on the International Space Station. So yes, we mm -hmm. it's a tradition we're, we're carrying on. And the only other comment I make about the spiders is yeah. they, were, they were able to adapt to microgravity without training. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's right. All right, let's uh, go over here. We might not have needed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, what impressed me was the way NASA treated the students uh, who did these experiments. They were treated as full PIs, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they, were, they knew right off the bat that when they got the data back, they were going to have to write a technical NASA paper and report their, their science. So they were treated like adult scientists, and I think that was a very, very good thing to do, and I hope that uh, uh, they, they can continue doing something like that. I might mention that we had goldfish on our mission. And, How did they fare? Uh, uh, Should I ask? A couple of them were pregnant, <laughs> and so uh, we had them in little plastic bags. You could hold them up, and, and the goldfish were all swimming around on outside loops. That's right. And uh, because apparently they needed that gravity vector through their belly to know which way to swim, so they swam around in loops. But when the lake, when the eggs hatched, the little bitty ones that looked like two eyes and a tail came out, and they looked at their parents going like that and couldn't figure out because they they, they were perfectly at home in their new environment. Uh, they didn't ha hadn't learned any bad habits, and so they were very comfortable in a weightless environment. Huh. I think Frank. Frank Boring with Aviation Week for our two uh, uh, for our two uh, station commanders, uh, Commander Carr. I was interested in your remarks about um, lessons learned for crew productivity, and I wonder if you could give us a few first principles that didn't work and that you figured out a better way to do it that to your knowledge, have been passed on to, to uh, ISS crews. And for Kevin Ford, I'd like to ask you if, if the crew on the space station today is maxed out or if there are ways that you can get more productivity out of the crew size that we have now and perhaps with some help from Russians or maybe even another crewman. Okay. Well, on, on Skylab, we started the mission with a, a tacit agreement to uh, uh, pick up the, the, the pace that was uh, being run by the uh, crew that was ahead of us. And uh, that was a bad decision because uh, we failed to take into account that you need a certain amount of time to accommodate to your new environment. And so we spent a good chunk of the mission running behind and making mistakes because we were being so rushed. And uh, we finally had what uh, I like to call the first sensitivity session in space. Uh, we, we agreed that uh, we would uh, talk about the problem. So on one pass over the U.S. Uh, from uh, northwest to southeast, uh, we were invited to tell uh, the people on the ground everything they were doing to make our life miserable and uh, why we needed, to, we, we needed to do something. And then on the next pass, which was, uh, if I remember correct, southwest to northeast, uh, the people on the ground got a chat, got a whack at us, and told us about all the things we were doing to screw up their schedule. <laughs> and uh, then we finally agreed. Okay, we both got a problem. We both got to deal with it. So we need to change the way we schedule things. And uh, the first, the first part of uh, the mission, uh, we had a, a checklist that uh, had every single move we were supposed to make charted. Every, we were like a, a bunch of donkeys following a carrot. And uh, that doesn't do much for uh, your uh, initiative. Uh, we decided after this little session that we would uh, put a lot of the routine stuff that, that really didn't matter when you did it, just that it gets done that day. We put it in what we called a shopping list. And uh, each one of us got our shopping list every day, and there were lots of little things on there that we had to get done sometime during the day. Uh, and uh, the only things that were on the schedule were those things that were precisely tied to a place in the trajectory where we were going to be where you had to do it at that instant. And boy, did that loosen up the schedule and make us more productive. Our productive level went just like that, almost instantly. And uh, uh, I think uh, that got passed on. I know uh, when, when I was working with Boeing, with Bill Pogue with Boeing, we, we uh, uh, tried to make sure that uh, that got into the planning for operations on the International Space Station and on the shuttle. And uh, 
uh, I think uh, a lot of that got in there, uh, but it's, it's just very important that uh, uh, we found that you've got to be able to uh, uh, have looseness in the schedule so that a certain amount of autonomy in the schedule to do things that, that really don't have to be done at a precise time. I, I think we're still working, working that issue. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let me say, I, I just found working in space uh, to be very difficult. Um, I came from a shuttle flight before, so I've flown two times. First time was a shuttle flight. Very choreographed uh, shuttle flight. Uh, I had seen everything I was going to do in that flight uh, for two weeks on the ground multiple times in simulations. Never did I pick up a checklist that I already hadn't made notes in. Uh, when I worked in space on the space station, from day one, I was doing things that I had never seen before. Uh, many cases you've never been trained on because something broke that they didn't think would broke and you're, you're going to be going to take the look. So uh, working up there is a very, very challenging environment. It's very hard for the ground to estimate, for example, how long something might take you to do. Um, we still have a system that, that's basically a day laid out for you uh, and a short-term plan. And uh, many of those things are tied to ground control because maybe a specialist will be in. You might need uh, KU uh, high rate comm system uh, to be available while you're doing those tasks uh, and that sort of thing. So, so many things are still tied to that. And, and it does actually make for a very stressful uh, system. And they, um, they now have for us some flexible tasks during the day uh, so that if you have, you made a call to ground, hey, I have this problem, and they can't answer the question for you for 15 minutes, well, that's going to put you 15 minutes down on your task unless you can go do something else and pick up another task. And so they've added some of these kinds of things in for us, and it really does. Uh, one of the things that's just fun to do on board is to try to get ahead on, on some of those tasks to make, to make your day end up at the end of the day so you've got all the work done if you can. Um, we've, uh, we've gotten a, a much better feeling, I think, now that uh, we're up there to do work that the ground can't necessarily figure out how long it's going to take you to do everything. Uh, you just are doing your own time study. At the end of the day, if you can't get everything done on your timeline, then you just call down and say, hey, it took, took me this long uh, to do that task. And they write it down for the next time. And I echo, uh, for the first 30 days, you're not getting anything done on time. I can tell you that right now. It's a very stressful place to be just because just, just getting uh, things going for the first time, finding things in stowage, recognizing what a part looks like that you might use multiple times, but uh, maybe, maybe you're not used to what it looks like in space and where to find it can, can make it difficult. So it takes a little while to, to get rolling and, uh, and we're working on that as a psychological aspect. It's going, to be, it's going to be important forever in space flight. Would you say you're maxed out? Uh, I would say I was working as hard as I could. Yeah, I guess that's the same thing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're to take another question for the audience, but I wanted to ask Jason to follow up on that a little bit. For those of us who don't do this as work, how, how, do, we keep, how do we keep track of what the astronauts are doing? And there, are there spreadsheets? Is someone writing it down? They're reporting to us. How, how do we yeah, keep track? Yeah, there's actually a whole multitude of folks on the ground that are uh, tracking all the tasks. There's a uh, custom software that people have written to kind of manage all the tasks that are being done. And that's one of the things, there's procedures behind each one of those tasks and such. So when everything, when, when you're talking about how everything was kind of scripted, there's procedures that go along with it. So when we talk about those time delays and things increasing, not only is it just rescheduling what you want, but then how do you actually rewrite procedures on the fly? So if you look at a piece of equipment or an experiment that you have never actually interacted with before, can you actually have the procedures autonomously written and rewritten based on whatever the outcome was that the, the crew member saw before? So it's a little more complex than just a simple spreadsheet. <laughs> um, and it needs to get even more autonomous so that we can, we can <coughs> maximize this, uh, these efficiencies and minimize the downtime. And then and give the crew the most autonomy we can um, so that they can make the right choices to make the best of their day. So. Cool. cool. All right, we got a question out here. Hello, my uh, hashtag is Maryland Space. <laughs> All right. I have a, uh, a post Skylab question for W5LFL. <laughs> Did you make many QSOs in uh, space and are you still active on a particular band today? W5LFL. <laughs> I'm the only one with that call sign, so it has to be addressed to me, apparently. <clears throat> and uh, no, I'm not really active at the moment, uh, but I have been a ham for, gosh, ever since I was in high school. So uh, that's been 65 years, at least, something like that. And so uh, um, um, I, I, I did count up. I think I probably had 
uh, four or five hundred contacts, separate contacts, while I was in space on the Space Lab mission. And the way that I did that was by having a tape recorder and recorded everything that came over the two-way transmission because there were so many people calling, dozens at a time. And I couldn't get them all written down. It would take too long to do it anyway. Only after coming back home did I and others then go through this and pull out all of those call signs that with, with whom I had uh, communicated. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, my son also got his amateur radio license before he went up. He did a much better job than I did, as a matter of fact, because he did re record more people. He somehow had it organized better than I did, and so he ended up with more contacts and uh, did much better than I did uh, for the amateur radio community, uh, otherwise known as hams. And so uh, that's the, uh, perhaps uh, the answers the, the question that you had. Now, oh, and you use this tape recorder a <laughs> lot, I think, because at some point your, your wife showed oh, up on uh, Skylab. Can you tell us a little bit about okay, that? Okay, that, that is another uh, story. <laughs> but uh, I think most people enjoyed the, the question uh, because uh, before we launched, like a month or two before we launched, uh, we worked out an arrangement with about three potential Capcoms, uh, Bob Crippen, Carl Henneyes, and a uh, third one. And uh, uh, we worked out a short script that only lasts about 30 or 45 seconds, as if there were a female, namely my wife, on board the spacecraft, communicating with the ground. Well, only these three people knew what to expect. <laughs> and so uh, when there was a, a, a fairly quiet pass coming up, I mentioned to Bob Crippen, who was the Capcom at the time, I'll have something for you on the next pass, Bob. He said, I'll be ready. That's all. <laughs> he knew what I was talking about. And so when we came around the next time, I simply paid, uh, played back this tape recording with my wife's voice on it. And this dialogue, which required Bob Crippen the Capcom to answer a certain length of sins. And so when she asked him a question, he was ready with the response. And this went back and forth for two or three <laughs> exchanges. And it sounded as normal as can be. And the people in the space, at, uh, at, on the ground in the, uh, uh, in the um, uh, communication center were amazed. Who is that coming down? Because it's coming, clearly coming down air to ground one. I know that voice is coming from up there, and it's female. There aren't any females there, I don't think. And so uh, they, they never figured out how that was done. And it was only about 15 or 20 years later at a reunion at the Johnson Space Center that I finally explained it to the, to the controllers how, how that was done. I consider that one of the best gotchas that, that, that we ever managed to Oh, and Gary, a science pilot and right. chief and comic. We, we don't get many gotchas on, on the folks in, in the mission control. <laughs> no, but uh, they were still were completely in the dark yeah. until we told them about it. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a question up here from our audience. Hi, I'm at Miss Linda 22. Um, what was the single most important discovery result observed on Skylab relating to the human anatomy? The human anatomy. What's the most important? Most important thing related to human anatomy. I don't know. Uh, it probably depends on your perspective. What is your basic <laughs> uh, uh, interest? Uh, what is your background? You might say that it's, uh, I, I know so much more about uh, adaptation, uh, physical exercise, or the, the way uh, food is uh, uh, consumed. And we did a lot of work on that. In fact, I have, I've mentioned to Kevin and a couple others before, we had some of the best food, in fact, the best food that's ever been provided in the space program on Skylab 40 years ago. And that's because it was one of the science experiments. And so uh, we had a selection of about 65 or 70 different kinds of food and drink that we could select for our own uh, menu, uh, which recycled every six days. The only constraint was we had to make this list one year ahead of time. And so uh, uh, we made out our list of what we wanted to make. And then uh, our contractor, who is uh, Whirlpool, we kind of joked at the time about we think maybe they stirred it all up in a washing machine before they packed it in the, in, the, in the containers. But actually, it was very good food. It's the best food that's ever been provided in the space program, I believe. And so uh, that's how uh, the, the food w was handled. And I think that was one of the uh, prim primary things that was uh, learned from uh, the Skylab. The best food even now? Say again? Better than now. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can, Absolute best. We're going to oh, have yeah. to take his word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, well, I, I've tried it, and uh, I've eaten it uh, both on the uh, space lab as well as on the uh, space shuttle. Uh, 
space uh, shuttle and, and uh, space lab, as well as Skylab. Even I get these terms confused <laughs> from time to time. But uh, 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 at the moment, it's uh, largely done by uh, whatever costs the least. Now, when Skylab, they did things that tasted the best for the crew members, and you picked the things out that you wanted to eat that suited your, uh, uh, your tastes uh, uh, as, as the primary con uh, consideration. So we really had good food. Uh, Jerry was uh, inhibited because his, <laughs> he, his flight was extended from two months to three months, approximately. So therefore, he only had food packed for two months on his flight, and every third day they had to eat K rations or something. Yeah. Some, you similar. guys ate all the sugar cookies. And that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that comes up with the question, what do you use for money? <laughs> in, on Skylab. Yeah. Really, you know, a dollar bill doesn't make much difference, but sugar cookies, that's different. <laughs> that was so, currency. Yeah, that was the currency on board uh, Skylab. But uh, uh, so uh, that's perhaps enough on the question. Too. <laughs> Let's take another question from social media. Thanks. Okay, this comes to us from Twitter, and it's how does NASA plan to work with collaborators to improve the International Space Station for the future? How to improve it? Maybe that's a good one for you, what are you guys. Jason? Any ideas? Yeah, I can start it off. I mean, right now, I mean, we're working with a number of our partners, our commercial partners that we have on board station today. You see us running experiments with companies like Bigelow Aerospace, where we're actually flying a large inflatable module, large but in, in that it's the first inflatable module that we've flown on board the space station. We're making improvements um, to our uh, just life support equipment, closed looping the water in order to have more water supplies. Uh, Skylab had the luxury of fairly large water tanks and a very a fairly large uh, waste uh, water uh, system as well. But it was all uh, open loop, meaning it was just used once and primarily thrown away at that point. Um, what we're trying to do is increase that water reuse to allow the crew to have more water resources on their way, um, have better environmental control systems that are more reliable as we're increasing the, that reliability on station today, hopefully then free up even more time for science to be done instead of just maintenance of the vehicle itself. Um, so we can, we're continuously doing that, um, not just by ourselves, with all, but with all of our collaborators as well um, in the private sector and our contractor bases to help uh, NASA along the way. In terms of the research that we're doing now, we, we coordinate our research uh, very closely with our international partners. So we regularly <laughs> meet with international partners involved in the International Space Station and and coordinate our research um, perspectives um, so that we don't have duplication. So we do the right, we're doing the right research to answer the questions that we need to answer to extend human exploration and attempt to be able to do things with, like explore Mars, which is really the foundation of what we're using the International Space Station right now for. Um, and in line with that, we're coordinating with our Russian colleagues now and planning a one-year increment. So we're doing more extensive studies in terms of the duration of the experiments on the biomedical perspective to be able to enable you know, human exploration at, the, at, the, at these even longer durations in the future. Great. I think we've got another question up here. Go right on ahead. Hi, my name is Trini Johnson. I was wondering, for you three that have been to space, would you go back to space? The answer is yes, I did. <laughs> and I would do it again if I had a chance. I mean, uh, I'd be more than pleased to accept that uh, uh, invitation. However, I don't think anyone's going to provide that invitation because there's so many other more capable people now, like Kevin, who could do a much better and more extensive job. So I don't expect to do it, uh, expect that op opportunity. But uh, certainly, just uh, if, you would, if you ask, would I like to go back or would, the, would I do it, the answer would certainly be yes. I'd go, but my wife won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would hop right back on uh, the uh, when you finally walk to the rocket and, and climb in. It's uh, it's one of the most amazing feelings because uh, the the kind of the price you pay to get there is the the long and arduous training uh, track to get there, and uh, it's really it's really nice to know you have a rocket seat uh, with your name on it and that you get a chance to get out there and fly up there. We all we all know what a privilege it is, of course, and uh, we love being there when we're there. 
I can say when I came home after 144 days, I was really, really kind of happy to come home again mm. and uh, be out in open space and feel the breeze in my face and even walk in the rain and those sorts of things. So I think uh, most of us are made for Earth and we really love Earth a lot, but we really like that magic place that's space also. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'd love to see a lot more people get to go someday. And I would, uh, I would certainly go back again. It's a long ways back though. It's probably, <laughs> probably never. So, but uh, it's very fun. Well, guys, we could keep this yeah. conversation, I think, right? We could keep this going for a few more hours or a couple of days. But we do have something that I think Kevin has a presentation that he would like to make um, to, our, to our fantastic Skylab crew that's, oh. with, that's with okay, us Okay, well, um, clearly, uh, when these guys went uh, to that final frontier to stay for a long time, uh, they did it uh, as the first ones, the ones who were entering the unknown, and uh, to see what it was going to be like and set the stage for us. And so it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here on the 40th anniversary with you guys and to meet you both. Uh, it's, a, it's a very big honor. And uh, on behalf of NASA, I'm given the privilege of presenting you uh, these in, in remembrance. Let's see if I got, yes, that one's for you, Owen. Thank you. And uh, maybe you can hold those up and then for, for Jerry here. And uh, thank you both uh, very much for putting on a track. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's a man who just came back from four and a half months in space. So you're kind of um, the wrong person making that description. You already they've, uh, they've learned how to make it easier for us, though. So thanks to you. We've got a few more minutes, and I, I wanted to first turn to, to Owen and to Jerry to, to give us some, some last thoughts about what, what, what you want this audience and the audience watching on NASA TV to be left with. What should we remember about Skylab? Hmm. Hmm. Do you want to do it first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what I would ask you to remember is that we may have done it first, but these guys are doing it better. And that people need to continue to do it better and better because we learn more and more as we do this thing. And uh, we just took the first step, and the rest of the steps are having, have been taken and are being taken right now. Uh, I'd only add to that that I think NASA is headed in the right direction. You know, we've uh, very recently... Uh, had a description of how we might go beyond the Earth-Moon system and begin to find uh, meteoroids or asteroids in space and bring those back to the Earth-Lunar environment and make a use and advantage of that for several different purposes. I think that's a great concept, and I think that it's one that uh, if we're, uh, NASA is allowed to continue and persist in this direction and with the proper funding to do it, then NASA will continue to be as successful as they have been all the way from Skylab shuttle and, uh, and space station as well. So I've been very encouraged by these new directions that, uh, uh, that uh, NASA has uh, pointed to the, the uh, agency in, and I'm looking forward, I hope I'm around for another 15 or 20 years, uh, to, uh, to, to, see, to see some of these things develop. For uh, Jason and Marshall, kind of the same question, but what can we leave our, our great audience here and the folks watching about about where it, what we're learning from what we've learned from Skylab, what we're learning on station, and how it's going to take us to even further yeah, destinations? I mean, it's, it's great to see the kind of the beginnings of long-term spaceflight um, on the 40th anniversary. We're remembering that. But we're going to go further and further into space. And how do we go those longer and longer durations? How do we build those systems? How do we how do we find the crew members that can actually fly these long duration missions and train them to be it? Folks that are in the audience, the students listening and such, those are the folks that will help build these systems. They're the folks that will be going on that. So we need all them to help us build these systems and come along with us. Um, so I think it's really important as we go further and further. It's not about the destination. It's always about what's the next destination. And as soon as we want to go to point X or stay in space for a certain long period of time, the next thing we want to do is go longer and go further. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always important to keep on, keep on uh, pushing further into the, uh, for exploration. Right. One so. small comment. <clears throat> Just yesterday, I received an email with a picture of a one-year-old little girl, happens to be my granddaughter, <laughs> sent, sent to me by uh, Richard's wife. And uh, uh, the comment on it was, I could see she was in her NASA flight suit. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, for, for her uh, uh, next flight, or for her first flight, uh, will uh, this uh, suit and uh, her background training be adequate? And so I'm already very pleased to see that some very young people are either thinking about it themselves or their parents are thinking about uh, what they will do for the third generation. And so uh, I, I think that there is a good 
uh, opportunity for these very young people to come along when we begin to think about the rest of the solar system and uh, think about uh, Mars and, and moons of Mars. Well, our time has come to a close. I hate that because, again, I could keep this conversation going forever and ever. But it doesn't have to end here. Keep following us on Google+, on Facebook, and on Twitter at NASA. Uh, we want to hear your questions and hear from you. Again, Owen and Jerry, thank you. I mean, this is an amazing. The legacy of Skylab is obviously uh, a huge impact not only on us but, but on the entire world. And, Kevin, thank you and your colleagues uh, for, for all of that and to Marshall and Jason for keep pushing us further. And uh, on behalf of the whole team, here at NASA. I want to thank you all and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks a lot. And we want you to stay tuned to NASA TV uh, for coverage of hatch opening of Expedition 35 mm -hmm. and the return of Tom Mashburn, Ramon Romanenko, and Commander Chris Hadfields to Earth later today. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.